Nobody knows they're joining a cult. Nobody makes the active decision to be brainwashed and join a cult. That would be ridiculous. Welcome to the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here is your host, your guide, your shining beacon of liberty, Mark Claire. Welcome back, my friends, to the Lions of Liberty podcast. And I'm not going to lie, I'm a little bit hungover from our 100th episode extravaganza, but I'm toughing it out to bring you another episode of this show, that being episode number 101. Now, before we get into the show today, I would be remiss to not tell you about this amazing concept of health sharing and the package that our sponsors from Health Excellence Select have put together. If you have been frustrated with your health insurance as I once was myself, head on over to lionsofliberty.com slash health for more information. My guest today is a consultant, a lecturer, and an intervention specialist who focuses on exit counseling and deprogramming of people who have fallen victim to cults. He is the founder and executive director of the Cult Education Institute and the author of Cults Inside Out, How People Get In and Can Get Out. Rick Ross, welcome to the Lions of Liberty podcast. Well, thank you for having me on. Now, Rick, I just finished reading your book, and it's chocked full of so much information about cults, and there's a lot of ground to cover here, but first I want to learn a little bit more about your story. So why don't you just tell us how you first became interested in the subject of cults? Well, I had no particular interest at all, and um, I went to visit my grandmother who lived in a Jewish nursing home, and uh, she was in her 80s, and I went to visit her one day, and she was very upset, and I asked her why, and she had apparently been confronted by a person who tried to uh, recruit her into a group. I later found out that this group had covertly infiltrated the paid professional staff of this nursing home and that they were targeting the elderly. As I investigated further, I found out that monies and donations had been deeded and bequeathed to them by the elderly after they had been recruited or influenced by them. And so I sought to basically get these people out of the nursing home. And I worked with the executive director of the nursing home and that led to I guess community activism, community organizing, and then uh, a stint in, at a social service agency, an educational bureau, and then I became a private consultant. So I guess you could say, Mark, it just kind of happened, and it snowballed, and here I am, 30 years plus later. So this is really a personal issue for you, or at least it started out that way. And that's just fascinating to me that these people actually infiltrated this entire institution. Essentially, was it just to to scam money out of the elderly people there? Or what was their goal by by infiltrating this home? Well, I think with any of these groups, I mean, there are three primary motivators, power, money, and sex. And in this particular group, I think power was a motivator and money was certainly a target. And the elderly were seen as vulnerable they can be exploited. And there's any number of con men, caregivers, and groups that exploit the elderly. And over the years, I've had many, many complaints about that. And so I learned as I moved forward in my career from the 80s, that my grandmother's situation was not a unique one. But it was that personal situation that affected my life that motivated me to get involved and be concerned about the issue. Let's backtrack a little bit and just get down to the basics. So what exactly is a cult? What, what are the, the defining characteristics of a cult? Well, I think it boils down to three primary characteristics. One is an absolute authoritarian leader that becomes the defining element or an object of worship. This is a totalitarian leader that has no meaningful accountability. And the group becomes personality driven and dominated by that leader. And then I think second, the group has a process of indoctrination or a synthesis, if you will, of coercive persuasion and influence techniques that break people down and rob them in large part of their ability to independently and critically think. And that in turn engenders dependency and submission to the group. And then finally, if it's a destructive cult, they are going to be hurting people. There will be a mandated system within the group that, as a byproduct of the group and its machinations, harms people. 
Now that varies from group to group. It could be money. It could be uh, physical abuse, sexual abuse. It could even be violence and death. And it varies in degree from group to group because as I said, you know, groups are focused on power, on money, on sex, and different leaders vary. Some are much more destructive than others. But what you look for are those three characteristics. The absolute totalitarian leader that becomes the defining element and driving force of the group. A program, if you will, that robs people in large part of their ability to critically think and independently function without the leadership telling them what to do in large part. And then finally, that the group in some way is harming people, exploiting people. And those three characteristics are typical of any destructive cult. They may vary in the way in which they appear, the facade that they may use to recruit people and retain people. But the way that they operate from the inside is the same. Are those characteristics that you laid out there, are those what you would say would really set apart a cult from, say, a mainstream religion? I mean, sometimes you'll hear people refer to mainstream religions as just no different than cults. So what would you say would be the real difference there? Because, I mean, you could argue some religions might be trying to indoctrinate people or, or that kind of thing, but there's obviously a difference from, say, a standardized religion and a cult. So can you explore that a little bit more? Well, I think there are two major differences between mainstream religion and a destructive cult. Number one, the presence of an absolute authoritarian leader that is the defining element of the group. That's why so many destructive cults will basically fall apart after the leader leaves or dies, because the leader is the hub of the wheel that is the group. And without the hub, the wheel collapses. And I think mainstream religion is based on more than just simply a singular leader and that leader's personality as the driving element of the group. And then second, mainstream religion, and this is a big one, mainstream religion basically says, look, this is what we believe. We believe in Jesus, we believe in Buddha, we believe in Yahweh, whatever we believe in, we're going to tell you up front, and you make an informed choice as to whether or not you want to throw in with us and become a, a believer, a member, or not. What cults do most often is they're deceptive. They do not tell people what their real expectations are. They may hold many of their beliefs secret. And when people become involved, they may not even know what they're becoming involved with. So there's this deception with uh, destructive cults that is not an element with mainstream religion run through a lot of examples of cults in your book. Can you give us a few that stand out to you? Obviously, I mean, some of them are very well known, such as Charles Manson and uh, everything that he's done. So what are the, some of the examples of cults that really stand out to you as maybe the most notorious or strike you as odd? Obviously, they're all a bit odd, but maybe ones that people haven't heard of. Well, I'm going to talk about a couple that people haven't heard of. There was a group in Chile called Colonia Dignidad that was led by a former Nazi who left Germany and created a 55-square-mile compound at the foot of the Andes. His name was Paul Schaefer. He died not long ago in 2010. He created his own world. It was a compound with his own prison, and he drugged the members of the group in order to have greater influence over them and to essentially make them submissive. And he was a pedophile who molested the children in the group. It was a horrible group, and the Chilean government eventually closed it down in the 90s. But when the dictator, Pinochet, was running Chile, he actually cooperated with Paul Schaefer. And Schaefer used his compound to torture and hold political prisoners for the Pinochet regime. And when the government, after Pinochet, raided the compound, they found the largest cache of weapons ever to be discovered in private hands in the history of Chile. And then Paul Schaefer was sentenced to prison. He died in prison in 2010. I think very few people in the United States know that this South American cult existed. It was, it was like its own city. 
self-sufficient, and uh, it was a, quite a large group involving hundreds and hundreds of people. Another group that very few people know about, but is a very important group, was the Movement for the Restoration of the Ten Commandments, which was a group in Uganda, in Africa, headed by a man by the name of Joseph Kibwetere. Kibwetere predicted the end of the world would come in 2000. Many groups did, but when his group realized that this prediction was not going to come true, they wanted their assets back that they had surrendered to Kibwetere. Rather than give them anything back, he murdered them and, and basically poisoned them, shot them, and then burned hundreds of them in a church after he chained the windows and doors shut. 750 people were found dead that were victims of Kebwetere in Uganda. And there's only one cult in modern history that exceeds the death count of the movement uh, for the restoration of the Ten Commandments, and that would be Jonestown, the infamous group that began as a very large and prominent church uh, in San Francisco and ended up in British Guyana where over 900 people died, uh, more than 200 of them children that were murdered by Jim Jones. That was in 1978. And then the other group that I think is very important to, to know about historically is the group Aum Shinrikyo in Japan. Uh, this group, which included thousands of people and had hundreds of millions of dollars and had actually recruited scientists from Japanese society with PhDs to develop chemical weapons for the group. In 1995, they released poison gas, sarin, in the Tokyo subway system. More than 2,000 people were hospitalized. Many died. And it was discovered later that Asahara, who's now languishing in prison and will eventually be executed, he is sentenced to death that he ordered the murder of an entire family in 1994, a lawyer, his wife, an infant child, because the lawyer was litigating against his group. Asahara led this cult, Am Shinrikyo, for many years. So those, those are the big groups that I look at from 1978 to today that really were large groups that involved uh, thousands or hundreds of members that had a real high death toll and had a very, very negative effect on society. Wow, it's really some shocking stuff that you hear when you really look into this stuff. And what sort of people are targeted by cults? I mean, you know, most of us would probably like to think that we're, we're not susceptible to this kind of thing. So what sort of person does a, does a cult typically go after? Well, I think it's like my grandmother. It's somebody who's going through a period in life where they may feel depressed. Uh, the elderly are often uh, suffering on medications, uh, have their, you know, they're, they're at the end of their life. And someone who's going through a difficult period in life, it could be a, a romantic breakup, uh, they lost their job, they, they're, they're flunking out of college, or they're just lonely. They're on a college campus away from home and they don't know anybody in this new environment. And along comes somebody who looks very nice, who's friendly. It could even be a coworker, a friend, uh, someone who they trust or seems trustworthy. And they come and they basically do a bait and switch con game. And they tell them, hey, uh, we have this wonderful uh, communications course for you. Uh, we're having a hayride. We're playing volleyball. We would just like to do a Bible study with you. Uh, we have this terrific get-rich-quick multi-level marketing scheme. Uh, we have the ultimate martial arts uh, course for you or the ultimate uh, training uh, for a weekend seminar. And you become involved. You don't really understand fully what you're becoming involved in, but you are vulnerable and you're feeling like you need something to help you get over a hump in life. And then you go, and then they get you. And they're very good at what they do. So one thing I take away from that and from reading your book is that is that people don't really realize they are, are getting involved in cults most of the time. They are involved with some new friends or a new group, 
And the next thing you know, they find themselves being cut off from their friends and family and really getting more involved in it. But they're never really self-aware of the fact that they're under this kind of influence. Is that correct? Yeah, Mark, you're absolutely right. Nobody deliberately says, hey, I want to join a destructive cult. Uh, and give them my money, give them my life. I mean, if they understood most of the people that I've done 500 interventions since 1982 all over the world, and I can, I can assure you that when I sit down with people, um, at the end they'll say to me, if I had known when I first got involved what I now know about the group, about uh, coercive persuasion techniques, about what the group's expectations of me would eventually be, how they would isolate me from my family, affect my relationships, my financial well-being, my health. Uh, I would never have gotten involved, but I did not understand that in the beginning. Uh, I've Listen, Mark, I've deprogrammed five medical doctors, including, including an orthopedic surgeon, an anesthesiologist. Uh, these are not stupid people. They're intelligent people, and I've seen them from all different socioeconomic backgrounds, educational levels, uh, good families, bad families. I think we want to really uh, not engage in the kind of uh, uh, easy uh, caricature of cult members that it's just stupid people, uh, crazy people, because quite frankly, those kind of people are not useful to a cult leader. A cult leader wants somebody who can make money for him or her and, and who can really be, you know, uh, productive. They don't want damaged goods. So what methods do cult leaders use to actually convince these people to become so compliant and obey them? I mean, you mentioned the deprogramming that you've done, and I want to get more into that in a moment. But how do these people get programmed in the first place? Well, basically, um, and there's, a, there's an excellent book that people can read. It's called Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism by Robert J. Lifton. And Lifton basically did his research on exiting uh, prisoners of war from North Korean prisoner of war camps uh, during the Korean conflict or at, shortly thereafter. And the North Koreans had developed a system within their camps in which they could break people down get them to sign confessions to things that they hadn't even done, uh, get them to uh, become props for propaganda films uh, against the United States, against South Korea, whatever. And so uh, Lifton wanted to find out in the late 50s, and he published his book in 61, how they did it. And in his book, in chapter 22, he lays out eight basic criteria to understand a thought reform program. And the single most important one, which is very familiar, uh, is the, con the control of the environment. And this would include control of information, associations, etc. The more extreme the group's expectations, the more extreme that control can be. Uh, the less extreme, perhaps the more relaxed it might be. But to a large extent, the group seeks to encapsulate people cut them off from an alternative perspective, from an outside frame of reference, and instead kind of cocoon them within an echo chamber where they will only hear what the cult leader wants them to hear and they'll associate with other cult members and they really won't um, have a, 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 an honest uh, way of getting an alternative perspective from someone outside of the group. And then, and then groups not only control the environment, and information, uh, they begin to ba basically tell the person there is no legitimate reason to leave, and whatever the leader says is right is right, and whatever the leader says is wrong is wrong, and the teachings of the group become what Lipton calls a sacred science, uh, filled with uh, buzzwords or thought-terminating cliches that keep people from thinking critically and create barriers for critical thinking. And then it's a process of manipulation within that controlled environment. Uh, and, you know, we all experience this to some degree. We experience influence techniques through advertising, through propaganda. Uh, what cult uh, indoctrination or thought reform is, is taking those techniques focusing them like a laser and using them in a much more comprehensive and total way.
So why don't you go through some of the methods you have successfully used to deprogram people and get them out of these cults? I've, I've done about 500 interventions uh, since 1982. And basically what I've done is uh, broken those down uh, into, uh, in my book, uh, into an easy to understand uh, chapter by chapter way of explaining the intervention process. Uh, first of all, uh, there is an assessment process where a family will assess whether or not the person is in a destructive cult, and they'll you know they'll do their research and make sure that they're not overreacting. Once they get past that point and they've determined that, yes, this is a cult situation and we're very concerned, then they're going to go through a preparation process where they're going to decide who's going to be involved in this intervention. Uh, and in that sense, it's very much like a drug or an alcohol intervention where there are family members involved. I never work with someone by myself. I'm always sitting with them with their family members also present. So the family's going to decide, and, and we're going to talk about it because at that point I would be involved, uh, who's the best people uh, to recruit in the family to be there? Will it be the mother, the father, the brother, the sister, uh, the spouse? Who, who, will, who will be present for the intervention? And then once we get into the intervention, there are basically four basic blocks of the intervention. One is discussing what is a destructive cult? What are those uh, uh, features or characteristics that would define a group as a destructive cult? And while we're talking about that, there may be some discussion as to what parallels there may be with the group that has drawn concern that we're doing the intervention about. And then second, what is a thought reform program? What is coercive persuasion? that people often refer to as brainwashing, which is a popular culture term. How does that work? What are the mechanics of it? How would you recognize that feature by feature, piece by piece? And again, are there parallels with the group? And then third, what about this group or leader has been kept secret from you? Are you fully aware of the group's history? Are you fully aware of everything about the leader, about the group, or have things been hidden from you, information deliberately withheld uh, by the group uh, to your detriment, uh, that you should be more fully informed to make an informed decision to continue? And then finally, what are your family's concerns? There are people here, they care about you, uh, why are they here? What are they worried about? Why are they worried about you? What has happened in your life in recent months, in recent years, that they have come to this place where now they're doing an intervention? And that, that process may take um, three eight-hour days, or it may take uh, typically th three or four eight-hour days, and then a day before that for preparation. And that basically is the intervention process to get someone out of a destructive cult. Now, do these people always want to go along with the intervention, or what, what kind of resistance do you see to this deprogramming attempts? Well, that's why it's really important, Mark, to have people in the room that this individual feels obligated to listen to, uh, people that uh, this person feels connected to and, and, and doesn't want to be rude to. And those people have been prepped, and I have met with them, and they, we have had a discussion about what to do if that person says, I'm going to leave. Uh, they're basically going to do everything except physical restraint. They're going to use moral suasion. They're going to say, please, do it for me. Please, I love you. I care about you. And I'm worried. Uh, maybe we're wrong. Maybe we're completely wrong, but the way for us to sort that out is for you to agree to stay and talk it out. And if the group is what you say it is, if the leader is an honest and good person, there's nothing to hide, there's nothing to run away from, and uh, you should be willing to sit and talk us through it because we're your family, we love you, and usually that works. So it's really about having people that th this person already trusts 
and cares about and, and having them there to to kind of guide them through the process and show them they're not against them they're they're there to be with them and and to really kind of rationalize with them with what what they're involved with uh, and you mentioned there that you know using every method short of physical coercion but i know that you did used to use a method from time to time known as involuntary deprogramming i know you now no longer suggest this method and i believe there are legal implications with it but can you just delve a little bit into that that method that you at one point did utilize when it took comes of in terms of involuntary deprogramming yes in my career i've done 500 interventions and about 12 historically were adults that were involuntarily held against their will um, under the supervision of their family and i participated in those interventions uh the idea being that these groups were so extreme that the family had no way to persuade the person to give them a day, an hour, any amount of time to discuss their concerns about the group. So the family would pay for security. They would hold the person against their will with the understanding that this would be for a, a, a predetermined amount of time, that there, this was only going to be for a few days. It wasn't going to be indefinite. Now, during the late 70s, there was an actual court procedure in California called conservatorship, where families could get a temporary conservatorship over someone in a destructive cult for the purposes of doing an intervention. But that, that law was struck down, and involuntary deprogramming ceased to exist. And uh, today, the only way that anyone does interventions that I'm aware of is on a voluntary basis, and that is the only way to go. But I have to be honest, and in the book I talk about this, I talk about the history of deprogramming, how it began in the, in the 70s, and how it evolved and changed. And what I would say is I, I continue to have sympathy for the families that feel that involuntary deprogramming was the only way they could go. And there were many, many people that whose lives were saved through involuntary deprogramming from terrible, uh, dangerous cults. And I, I, I just have to say that. And there are many families who call me today who I have to tell them, there's nothing I can do, do for you and nothing anyone can do for you regarding an intervention. I know that your son or your daughter, or your spouse is in a very, uh, negative group that that in fact it might even be dangerous and and life-threatening but there's nothing legally that you can do because you have no access and there's no basis to do an intervention and speaking of involuntary deprogramming i know there is one case that you were involved with that that did make headlines uh with a gentleman named jason scott and uh, I, I know you've told me you guys are actually uh, friends now, which I find really interesting. So I'm wondering if you could just touch on that real quick, and especially as it pertains to Scientology, which, which of course is getting a lot of attention nowadays, of course, because of all the celebrities involved with it, but also because of the new documentary that is getting a lot of attention known as Going Clear. So could you touch on that case quickly? Yes. 1990, I was um, hired by a woman by the, by the name of Kathy Tonkin, uh, who had left a very extreme uh, group in uh, Bellevue, Washington, uh, that she considered a cult and that was very cult-like, uh, very authoritarian leader. And the reason that uh, Kathy left the group was because a youth minister she found uh, with her son, who was 14, and he was sexually molesting her son. And so she decided to first confront the head of the group and say, look, how can you have a youth minister that's molesting children? And when the, when the minister that headed the group said he would do nothing and refused to take any action, she decided to pull her family out. Uh, she had uh, many children. Uh, her three eldest children, boys, uh, two were minors who I did interventions to get them out successfully. But the one boy turned 18 before we could do a intervention under her uh, custody. Uh, and he was kept by the group. And finally, Kathy decided to do an involuntary intervention. Uh, her son, Jason, was uh, held against his will for five days. After five days, uh, Kathy Tonkin decided that her son had heard enough, that we had done enough, and we decided to end the intervention. 
Uh, we were not uh, confident that Jason would leave the group. He said he would. Uh, later, we discovered that he was basically faking uh, to just end the intervention. Um, he ran away. He immediately contacted the police. The police were really going to arrest uh, his mother, uh, but decided not to. I was arrested. The security people were arrested. And eventually we went through a criminal trial in which we were found not guilty by a jury. After that, a lawyer who is a Scientologist and very well known for litigating on behalf of the Church of Scientology, Kendrick Moxon, uh, was put together with Jason Scott uh, through an intermediary. Uh, and the idea that uh, Kendrick Moxon had was he wanted to destroy me uh, for his own reasons, uh, for Scientology's reasons. And he also wanted to destroy an organization called the Cult Awareness Network uh, by, by involving them in the litigation. Uh, it went through a federal court and it became a civil lawsuit. And at that point, both uh, the Cult Awareness Network and myself were financially exhausted. Uh, the Cult Awareness Network had been sued more than 100 times by Scientology uh, over everything imaginable, and I had been exhausted financially through the criminal trial. So we had very limited resources. We lost the civil suit. Uh, there was a $3 million judgment against me in 1995. Uh, subsequently, I declared bankruptcy, as most people would under that uh, situation. But then in 1996, something really remarkable happened. Uh, I guess the information that Jason received during the intervention percolated in his head. And even though he had uh, been involved in an arranged marriage and had two children in, in, uh, very quickly uh, thereafter, he decided to leave the group. His wife would not leave. She stayed. And he came to his mother's house, and his mother put him together with me, and he agreed to sell me the $3 million judgment against me for $5,000 cash. If I would provide him with 200 hours of additional time, uh, my time, what he had planned to do was deprogram his wife. So here was this young man, at that time I guess he was, oh, about in his early 20s, and he had uh, two children, he had a wife embedded in this group, and now like his mother before him, he wanted me to deprogram a loved one, and it was his wife. That deprogramming never happened. Uh, so after Jason went through a divorce and realized that there was no way that he would ever get his wife out of the group, um, we did become friends and were in touch. Uh, ironically, when one of his two daughters became a teenager, she ran away because she could not take the rules, the regulation, uh, the constraints of the group and, and what it meant to her growing up. Uh, and, and she came to her father's house, to Jason's house. And I ended up talking to her by speakerphone because Jason said, you know, the only person that's going to be able to explain to you what happened to me and what happened to our family is Rick. And so uh, he called me from uh, the Pacific Northwest and we all talked on speakerphone. And that was one of the last times I talked with Jason not too many years ago. That's a really interesting story and quite the turnaround from uh, from your initial encounter with him. Uh, Rick, this is fascinating stuff. I have just a couple more points I want to touch on with you. But first, I need to tell everyone out there about our great sponsors, Health Excellence Select. Believe me, guys, I know nobody likes dealing with health insurance companies. It's bad enough that you're sick, but now, thanks to the ACA, you're forced to pay for all sorts of coverage you don't even want or need, and the odds are you are indeed paying for it. I was frustrated, too, until I did some research and found out about health sharing, where like-minded, health-conscious individuals get together to cover each other's medical costs. And now the fine folks at Health Excellence Select have taken it to another level with a complete health care service, Combining health sharing with personal care assistance to help you find the doctors that you need at the best price, 24-7 phone access to physicians, along with discounts on dental and vision. 
And if that wasn't enough, they even have a website that works, if you can believe that. Guys, if you are struggling with a solution to your healthcare needs, look no further than Health Excellence Select. For more information, head on over to lionsofliberty.com slash health. Rick, I like to ask my guests for a book recommendation, other than your own, of course, which, which we've been discussing here today. So do you have any other books on cults that you would recommend for people that are interested in exploring this even more, even beyond your own work? Yes, I would recommend um, a number of books. I think the book Cults in Our Midst by the psychologist Margaret Singer is, is quite good. Uh, there's also uh, the book I mentioned before, Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism by Robert J. Lifton, a psychiatrist who once taught at Harvard Medical School. And by the way, Lifton also wrote a paper called Cult Formation, where those three characteristics that I mentioned that are the primary features of a destructive cult were first identified in the early 80s. And I like to think of that as the nucleus for a definition of a destructive cult. But those two books, Cults in Our Midst by Singer, uh, Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism by Lifton, are really good reading to understand uh, the dynamics of groups. And what I've tried to do in my book, uh, Cults Inside Out, through the footnotes and the bibliography, is bring in the research of Singer and Lipton and many others so that people can get a comprehensive uh, history of cults and an understanding of how they operate up to date. Uh, Rick, I've got just one more question for you. And, you know, you've spent so many decades here becoming becoming an expert on cults and, and really getting to know them inside and out, quite literally. And I'm wondering if there are any sort of cultish elements that you see in our society at all that, that we don't necessarily recognize as, as having cultish attributes, whether it's in the political arena, whether it's in the business arena. Is there anything that stands out to you uh, in that sense? Uh, yes. Um, I would say, first of all, that the radicalization process being used by ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, and the leadership structure of those organizations is very cult-like. And the uh, way in which they indoctrinate people within their training camps is very reminiscent of Lifton and a thought reform program. So I think that the radicalization process in extremist groups uh, like ISIS and Al-Qaeda and Boko Haram is very much like a cult. And I think what we're seeing in our society, particularly as a result of the internet, as a result of social media and cable news and, and, and just cable in general, is that people can create echo chambers. Uh, we can, through the selection of our friends on Facebook, uh, who we follow on Twitter, who we listen to on, on cable news, who we uh, follow uh, a, a, through a blog or whatever, we can cocoon ourselves in a way in which we never hear any alternative ideas. And it can harden people, whether they're on the left or the right or they're in the center in our country, in a position where they have a kind of mindset in which they're not really considering alternative ideas. And so what I, I, I would suggest is uh, look, at, look at other perspectives and allow the bubble, if you have a bubble in your life, allow it to be permeated with outside ideas and be challenged. And in that sense, you can't uh, fall into that trap of being in an echo chamber and becoming in a kind of uh, cult-like mindset. Well, that's certainly sound advice, Rick, and it's something that uh, I think a lot of us could take to heart, uh, especially even uh, in the political arena, which is what we deal with largely here at the Lions of Liberty podcast. I think people of every uh, political persuasion often fall into that bubble where they only hear what's what's in their own echo chamber. So I think we could all use that advice uh, even outside of the concept of, of specific cults in the way you describe them. So, Rick, thank you so much for joining me today on the show. I really do appreciate it. This is a fascinating subject, and I was really happy to discuss it with you. Before I let you go, why don't you just take a minute to let everybody out there know how they can get in touch with you and feel free to plug any other projects you've got going on. The web presence of the Cult Education Institute is culteducation.com. And that is where you will find a, a, a database 
that includes tens of thousands of research papers and articles divided into hundreds of subsections about various groups, leaders, movements, some that have been called cults, uh, that has been under construction since its launch in 1996. It's probably the largest internet archive in its genre uh, accessible through the web. So that's culteducation.com. Also, I would strongly suggest people peruse the book, Cults Inside Out, How People Get In and Can Get Out. And there's also uh, educational DVDs available through the Cult Education Institute, which is a member of the American Library Association and an educational uh, 501c3 nonprofit charitable institution. Rick Ross of the Cult Education Institute. Be sure to look into his work. And thanks again for joining me today, Rick. Thank you very much, Mark, for having me on. Really appreciate it. Take care. Well, 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 guys, what did you think of my interview there with Rick Ross? I can't really hear what you think right now because, uh, you know, you, you got headphones on or whatever and you're not talking to me. You're not here in the room with me, unfortunately. But I do want to hear what you think. You can, of course, tell us what you think in so many ways, mostly by communicating with us on our social media, facebook.com slash Lions of Liberty. You can tweet to us over on the Twitter at Lions of Liberty. You can find us on Google+. Plus. You can even communicate with us more directly by joining our new Facebook forum. We will, of course, link to that in the show notes. And the show notes for this show can all be found now at lionsofliberty.com slash 101. That will be the format going forward. So if you hear an episode number at the top of the show and you need more information, you need to get to those show notes, all you got to do is go to lionsofliberty.com slash that episode number. So, of course, for this episode, lionsofliberty.com slash 101 will get you all the show notes for this show. And what a fascinating show it was, if I do say so myself. Speaking to Rick Ross, a guy who's been immersed in the subject of cults for nearly 30 years here, and he has done extensive research into how cults operate. So I do highly recommend checking out his book, Cults Inside Out. Now, I know what you're thinking, guys. What's all this got to do with liberty, man? Well, I'll tell you what it's got to do with liberty. As Mr. Ross mentioned, we see, can see sort of cultish behavior and cultish elements in many of our society's institutions. We can see it in our advertising. We see it in politics. We see it in our institutions. I mean, how many times do people just blindly follow and chant for a certain presidential candidate for whatever reason or blindly chant and cheer for their party, whether it's the Republicans, whether it's the Democrats? Even libertarians, perchance. I'm not leaving you guys alone. I'm not saying that these things are cults, but they certainly exhibit some cultish behavior, some kinds of things that we should be on the lookout for, because we can't just be parroting what we hear from other people. Even our quote-unquote leaders, when developing our political positions, we need to think for ourselves. We need to have intuition. We need to use reason to and logic to arrive at our beliefs. This seems very straightforward, but many people don't seem to do that when it comes to politics and when it comes to many other things in our society. Now, it's okay if you're not using reason and logic to decide what sports team to cheer for or what, or what chant to do at the game, because that's all well and good, and there aren't people's lives necessarily at stake. But when we're talking politics, there are people's lives at the other end of the policies that we come to. So it's very important that we think rationally when it comes to politics. Now, before I sign off here today, I did just want to share a little personal story of my own experience with a cult. That's right. I actually have experience with a cult, but it's not the kind of thing you would think of as a cult normally. It's something that is called a sales cult. You might want to Google that term, sales cult. And I bet you that when you Google that term, you will see the name DS Max. You will see the name Sidcor. You will see the name Devil Corporation. That is the nickname that has been given to the corporation that I did actually work under at one point and what I would now have come to consider a sales cult. And, and obviously I didn't know I was joining a cult. Just like Mr. Ross said, nobody knows they're joining a cult. Nobody makes the active decision to be brainwashed and join a cult. That would be ridiculous. But you know, I, I'll just tell you the story. It happened when I was about 24, 25 years old living out here in Los Angeles. Uh, I was laid off from my job. I didn't really have that much savings. I was just trying to get started out in the television industry. I was kind of freaking out. I was kind of worried about things. I, I, I thought about maybe leaving and moving back home, but you know, I couldn't give up on my dreams so easily. But I, I just needed to make ends meet. I needed to find a job quick. So I saw this advertisement on Craigslist for a sports marketing agent or to marketing and sales. 
sales. No experience needed, just a great attitude. Well, hey, I got a great attitude, and I got no experience, so this sounds great. I'm a big sports fan. Of course, I'll enjoy sports marketing, so I go and show up to this place in Burbank, California. I may as well name these guys Kelly Advertising. Matt Kelly was the guy running that operation, and I went in, and you guess, you got a nice little interview there, and, and yeah, you know, they make you feel like you got a really cool sales career coming up, and, and sure enough, the next day I get hired, and I come in, and ne- before you know it, you realize that this quote-unquote sports sales marketing job is really just going door-to-door and knocking on doors and selling little coupons. Well, there's nothing wrong with knocking on doors and selling coupons. Don't get me wrong. But the way they do this and the way they drag you in and the way they don't really reveal all the information until it's really happening, combine that with their their sort of brainwashing techniques that they use. They had a, a morning ritual where we'd have all these little chants, these little bells you would ring, and and all sorts of little phrases you had to use, like juice, your juice. That's just the phrase to shoot down any negative things. Any, if you question anything, hey, juice, man, why are you nagging out? All these little phrases to dissuade any sort of questioning of the organization. And I actually did pretty well at it. I made some sales. Uh, you know, they really built up this dream, though, this dream of not just being a salesman, but of running your own operation, of running your own business, of taking over, of starting your own branch, moving to another city, being your own boss. I mean, it sounds so great. But the fact is, most of these people do not become their own boss. Most of these people do not end up running their own business. Most of these people end up crashing and burning and flaming out, which is why they always have this huge turnaround of new people in there. New people to brainwash, to go door to door, to make these sales. And I'm not saying that these people did anything mm, totally wrong to me. They didn't force me to be there. But they do use a uh, very coercive, persuasive tactics in the way they do things. And it was only after a meeting with one of the top guys at this company, DS Max or Sid Core. You can look those up. I'll link to all this stuff in the show notes as well. When he mentioned, don't worry about what those guys are saying on the internet. Well, this guy, when I heard that, I said, well, what are these guys saying on the internet? So I started doing some research and I, I started finding out terms, you know, other people's experiences and how they were similar to mine. I found the term sales cult and I realized I was in one. This guy, your host, your host, your guide, your shining beacon of liberty. Even I once fell victim to a cult. That's true. So look it up. You'd be surprised at where you can find organizations and people that behave in cultish manners. It's not all Scientology. It's not all David Koresh. It's often uh, much more subtle and much less obvious than that. And uh, I highly recommend the documentary Going Clear as well on HBO if you want to see how one of the largest and and most, I guess, successful in in their terms cult in history has kind of uh, has managed to brainwash seemingly half of Hollywood into joining them. And uh, trust me, there's nothing stranger than seeing than seeing Tom Cruise basically give a, a Heil Hitler to LRH, to L. Ron Hubbard, their, their god, or what have you. Um, so it's really intriguing stuff. I hope this show is intriguing stuff to you guys. I hope you'll keep coming on back each and every Monday and Tuesday here at the Lions of Liberty podcast. You can find us on lionsofliberty.com, of course, those days. We release to iTunes, Stitcher Radio. You can hear us on the weekends at libertytalk.fm and throughout the week at lrn.fm, the Liberty Radio Network. I think I covered all my bases, and I hope we covered all your questions you had about cults. If you have any more, of course. Feel free to hit me up, Mark, M-A-R-C, at lionsofliberty.com, or get to us on our social media. And until next week, folks, live long and live free. Free from cults, hopefully. Head of Editing and Mastering is John Dahlberg.